and welcome to another episode of the Cryptid Ramblers podcast. As always, I'm Callum from a very hot and humid Essex in uh, England. Uh, now, unfortunately, um, I will be without my partner in crime and co-host Scott. Uh, sadly, he's fallen victim to the dreaded Rona. Uh, that's right, COVID-19. Um, so in light of his absence, uh, we'll be doing a slightly different episode this time. Um, not only because I'm running solo, um, but we'll also be taking a brief break from Helia, Kentucky and venturing not too far away in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, but before we get stuck in, I just wanted to thank everyone for the response that we've had so far to our last episode, which was on Helia Part 1, which essentially covered Season 1 of the uh, the documentary. Um, the reach it's had uh, in just over a week is amazing, quite frankly, and we so would never have expected it to be uh, so quick so you know thank you for that um for those that have listened uh you know don't worry we will hopefully be back in Helia for part two on the next episode uh hopefully scott will be back by then um so get well mate uh, hope all is well so you may remember also uh we announced opening a merch store uh, i think we shared it in the last episode uh, and we also included it on some of the uh, socials um it's going to include things like all the classics really so your t-shirts hoodies um you know mugs phone cases and the like um before we launched it properly and you know let it go live we wanted to just test a few samples um and we're pleased to say that um we are indeed happy with the the quality um and we will be officially launching the store so keep an eye out on the socials over the sort of coming days for for more info um and speaking of uh, the socials we have now come into uh the modern world and uh joined the platform that is twitter um avoided it for sort of as long as we could for no particular reason i don't think other than just you know i don't think we could necessarily be bothered to manage yet another uh social but uh it's becoming more 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 prominent now and more important for us to get on you know many of these platforms as we can um so uh for those who are on on Twitter and would like to follow us, um, of course we'd be grateful. And uh, our handle, which is a bit difficult to uh, remember, is at Cryptid Ramblers. Um, so yeah, as I say, if you can go on, share any posts that we've put on there so far. I think we've only really been active on there for you know sort of just over a week, pretty much from the launch of the Helia episode. Um, so yeah, if you could jump on there and show some love, that'd be uh, that'd be great. Um, right, I think that's all of the announcements that I've got uh, sort of for the start, so um, let's uh, jump in. Um, now, as you probably would have seen from the thumbnail, um, I will be discussing the mystery surrounding the town of Centralia, Pennsylvania. Um, it's not really a, you know, sort of conspiracy or, or cryptid-driven um, episode, this one, but uh, I thought it was uh, interesting nonetheless, and you know, kind of wanted to share with you guys what I had uh, essentially found. Um, now, for me, the, you know, the real mystery kind of started with a, an article that I'd read um, that dates back to uh, February 14th, 1981. Um, yeah, Valentine's Day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this uh, this sort of first kind of introduction to, to the mystery occurred, uh, and it involved a 12-year-old boy by the name of Todd Dombowski, uh, he notices a, um, a, a sort of a smoke um, or a gas coming from beneath the lawn in his grandmother's backyard. Now he walks over to, you know, investigate as you would, because it would be quite an odd thing to to see, and he he basically disappears into a sinkhole that just opens up beneath his feet, right in his uh, his grandmother's backyard. Um, now. He it was quite a deep sinkhole compared to his size, being you know only twelve years old. But thankfully, what saved him from falling deeper into it um, was the fact that he grabbed onto a fairly substantial tree root, you know, on his way down. Um, you know, almost the sort of thing you'd see in a you know in a sort of a horror film or something. You know, just there just so happens to be that lucky uh, tree root. Um, but he grabbed on. Luckily, he uh, you know survived to tell the tale. Um, now. This is kind of what sparked my, you know, sort of interest, uh, not just, you know, sort of the, the sinkholes 
but the you know the smoke coming from the ground the fact he just opened up beneath his feet um but as you can imagine there is a far greater you know story um to this which is what i'll you know jump into now now the the original kind of mystery if you like uh first occurred on the 27th of may 1962 um basically an inspector um from the sort of local uh council local government basically told centralia council that the location of their dump or or landfill didn't meet state regulations so they basically arranged for the local fire department to come down and basically set the dump alight as a way of kind of getting rid of it and clearing the landfill and that was their way of sort of cleaning it up, I guess, the most economically, maybe, or environmentally friendly, you know, I'm not too sure. Um, Now, normally when they've done this before, it's just burnt, you know, to a point where it's, you know, just kind of smouldering ash, and the fire department have returned and um, just sort of put out the, 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 you know, the remaining fire. Um, However, this time, um, it wasn't put out properly, and so it was left to smoulder for longer, and the you know the, the the rubbish the debris was burning hotter than they anticipated um it then unfortunately spread to the labyrinth of coal mines and tunnels that uh, are beneath the surface and it basically began burning um not so for those that that don't know um centralia that, that was essentially built around the coal mines uh for the, the miners to to live in so that was its main um kind of bread and butter really was uh, was was the coal um the the fire department did return um to, to try and put out the fire i don't know whether that was immediately or you know the the following day um but the smoke was just pouring out through the ground red hot rocks um were near the entrances to to some of the mines and they were just burning you know if you imagine i don't want to barbecue you know those those hot kind of red coals before they go white that's basically what was surrounding most of these mine entrances um and there you know essentially over a period of around 20 years the fire just kept burning and burning um the roads would get to temperatures of 900 degrees um which was fahrenheit um which is what i assume because obviously it's happened in uh in in america um but whichever way you measure it 900 degrees is is going to be pretty bloody hot <laughs> um now at this point you know sort of 20 years on the local residents have, have rightly sort of had enough and demanded that a town meeting was held to discuss how they're going to eventually try to put this you know 20 year long fire out um and they were basically told by the local governors that it wouldn't be as easy as just putting it out uh, and they didn't really have a plan or they didn't know how they were going to go about doing it. So after a fairly swift vote, the residents uh, essentially decided that they would leave Centralia for, you know, for their own their own safety. Um, the, you know, the government quite quickly agreed and determined that it wasn't safe for residents to stay because of the um you know toxic gases that were being emitted from the ground and this is through the grass uh, like what happened to you know Todd Dombowski it's coming through the actual road um uh, it's quite a famous route that goes through Centralia Pennsylvania uh, route 61 i believe you know the road is cracking and the you know the smoke is you know is kind of pouring through um it supposedly cost the government initially 1 million dollars to move the uh, the initial number of uh, residents uh, from the area to towns pretty much on the outskirts. I think the majority of them went to towns that were up in the uh, mountains uh, that kind of bordered um, Centralia. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the main kind of drive, certainly from the, the government in terms of paying out that money, uh, was because, as I say, of the toxic gases, but they were now starting to get into the homes of you know residents um you know and obviously majority of them being you know either miners or descendants of miners they're all you know sort of used to uh you know bad smoke and dodgy lungs and everything else and this was only going to make things uh you know worse for them 
um, so yeah, residents moved, um, businesses were forced to close, and uh, after a while, um, conveniently enough, uh, the government then bought the land, um, they say, as a way to prevent people from being able to basically come in back into the town and repopulate, you know, their houses or for new people to move in once they see that there are houses you know, sort of available. Um, it was also done because they didn't believe the fire would ever be put out. So it's basically been bought up as kind of dead land, really, um, and sort of a, a no-go area. You know, as you can imagine, um, it's not really set up as a tourist destination, but because of the sheer mystery of what happened and, you know, why it still burns, um, you know, people, mostly kind of urban explorers, do, you know, kind of venture there, but, you know, is against... Uh, you know their their own better judgment, I suppose, because they are warned from entering, um, especially without the right breathing uh, apparatus. Um, now, following on from that, I guess one of the main sort of conspiracies, certainly within the town of Centralia, um, is that the fire was left burning deliberately, so the government could then buy the land back cheap um, once everyone had been sort of forced out of their homes. And this was because the coal in the mines was seen as very valuable and they didn't want, you know, the miners that lived there and other businesses within the town to, you know, essentially get their hands on it. Um, in spite of that, many businesses and um, entrepreneurs wanted to apply for licenses to give them the right to basically dig holes and mine the coal, you know, that was that was valuable and usable. Um, so once they'd bought the land, the government then made sure that the town was deemed uninhabitable um, and therefore they remained in control of, you know, both the land and the mines themselves. So, you know, nothing's really kind of improved. I've, you know, I've seen a lot of kind of counteracting articles or arguments, you know, to say that there is no real truth in that conspiracy and that's mostly been created by you know, sort of disgruntled residents um, because they've actually deemed that if there's any coal left down there, you know, that is usable, um, it's not really going to hold much value because it would have been, you know, tarnished or, you know, affected some way by the fire that still burns to this day. So it's conflicting arguments, but you can see why the residents would come to, uh, you know, come to that conclusion. You know, it's not the first time that, uh, you know, a government has put, you know, their constituents or their their residents deliberately in harm's way you know for their own uh you know for their own gain um you know what the world's going through at the moment you know kind of springs to mind <laughs> um get a little uh political there for you um now to this day uh, you know as i say the, the fire is still burning beneath the town of uh, centralia pennsylvania uh and they still can't figure out why it's still going and why it won't stop um of course they've you know they've tried uh, but again part of the conspiracy is that the residents feel that they're deliberately failing these attempts to put it out because they basically don't want to extinguish it um and as i say every attempt so far has been uh, has been thwarted for one reason or another they've dug holes at various points around the mines um obviously as soon as they've done that it's given them access to more oxygen, therefore the, the fire has been uh, fueled. Uh, it's also then provided another channel for it to spread even further, so they've actually made it, you know, kind of worse. So again, you could see why they would think it was, uh, you know, deliberate. Um, they've also tried to cut it off um, by digging the coal out, um, but that again hasn't helped. If anything, it's it's just helped the, the spread, you know, even more. Um, They've also tried pumping water directly into these channels to eventually go down into the uh, the mines, but it doesn't appear to have been enough. Um, in fact, they've pumped water down into the mines for a year solid, and it's got to the point now where the fire department believe that if they were to switch it off, there would still be enough residual heat to essentially start the fire up again, um, which to me is just nuts that if they've been pumping gallons and gallons of water into these channels and mines for a year that just switching it off would leave enough residual heat to you know kind of spark it again now whether this feeds into the conspiracy and it's just them saying that 
um you know I, I i don't really i don't really know i can't see how it would affect it but you know i suppose you never know you but you would have thought that after a year that sort of water would at least reduce the residual heat and you just have kind of smoldering coals i guess you know and then like with any barbecue you leave it overnight and it's done by the next day but this is obviously on a much grander scale um and following that experts actually believe that the uh you know the, the max temperature um under the ground could be anywhere between a thousand and two thousand degrees fahrenheit which is just mad really um sinkholes continue to open up and buildings continue to collapse and and fall into them um they they've now estimated that it could take another 200 years uh or say another 200 years 200 years for the fire to finally burn out and this has been kind of based on the fact that temperatures on the surface are still reaching anything between two and three hundred degrees um you know which again is just nuts so you wouldn't even be able to drive along them walk on them and to be honest once you if you see the actual state of the the roads especially this route 66 you won't be able to drive along it anyway um you know as always for reference i will share or we will share um images on the socials of the actual town itself and it it just looks like a war zone um you know it looks like something yeah from a from a, a war film or from a i don't know a disaster movie um you know the roads have been literally cracked open and you know pulled apart you know literal sinkholes have you know been opening up and buildings and whatever else have uh you know have collapsed into them you know whatever buildings are left are just just dilapidated you know the roofs are gone the windows are gone you know and, and nature is kind of starting to reclaim it um and it does look post-apocalypse really like literally like something out of a out of a film um you know which is is really just you know quite bizarre um now to sort of offer some context in terms of the numbers and you know residents i thought i'd just go through some of the kind of population numbers um over the uh, over the decades um so if we go back to 1962 when this happened when the you know when the fire started um it's believed that the total population at the time was around 1400 people so in the grand scheme of things it's still not a lot of people but you know for a small town of, of this nature you know that's quite a substantial number um now, 20 years later, um, so, you know, sort of beginning to mid 80s uh, and obviously around the time of the Dombowski boy falling into the, the sinkhole, the population had uh, dropped, um, but not by too much, but to about a thousand residents. Um, but as the town obviously became more and more uninhabitable, the population drastically dropped. Now, by the 90s, so only... 10, 10 plus years later the population had actually dropped to only 63 people so you know that, that's that's just a stupid amount really that's what 937 people vacating the uh the, the town um now presumably this would have been part of the uh you know part of the government's um the government's plan to kind of ship them all out and send them to these uh neighboring towns you know in the sort of the mountains and uh you know sort of further afield now interestingly a census was actually taken back in 2010 i think that was the the last one to be done as well um and it was recorded that there were only 10 people remaining in the town of centralia uh, and this consisted of only five houses um that were left you know standing um now when they sold the properties uh or sorry bought the the properties back off the residents like i say most of them went into neighboring towns including those that were up in you know the mountains so they were still not you know kind of too far but you know business had, had died obviously the you know the coal mines had been discontinued um and there wasn't anything there for, for people anymore the, the you know the, the life and soul of the town you know had been um it, it, it had been literally killed you know and taken out of it so you know you do wonder you know what were these people you know supposed to do really um it's quite harrowing actually when you look at the the photos that you know people were driven out of their homes by you know a fairly unexplicable event and one that's seemingly been just allowed to happen and and kind of just left really um so it is it is bizarre when you see the photos and as i say we'll uh 
you know, we'll post those on the, the socials in, in sort of the coming days um, or sorry, from from next week when we actually, uh, you know, launch the episode. For anyone that may have an inkling from the thumbnail, uh, there was some obvious uh, inspiration on our part and that was the, we've actually used, obviously, the sign from uh, from the, you know, the, the popular... Uh, film adaptation of the gaming franchise Silent Hill. Um, now, as you can probably imagine, if you haven't guessed already, um, Centralia was used as the influence for basically the set that the film was based upon. Uh, and obviously the, the town of Silent Hill in the game uh, is actually based in good old West Virginia. So uh, there you go. It's just taken a shy of 22 minutes to... Uh, mentioned good old West Virginia. Um but obviously the the film was originally obviously based from the the gaming franchise itself, but for the the town in terms of the aesthetics and the fact that there's this kind of fire burning beneath the the town and whatever, that was directly taken from Centralia. Um it's been noted that the screenwriter of the film, uh Roger Avery, I believe his name was, um actually visited the town um and yeah, actually used some of the external shots um for the film uh, a lot of the actual scenes around the town um was actually filmed in and around west virginia itself but for you know like the approach up to silent hill um and like i say some of the sort of the aerial drone shots that was actually centralia so if you happen to um you know listen to this and then watch the film at any point keep an eye out because yeah you might sort of see where the uh influences come from failing that you might see from the socials that uh yeah there are some you know definite sort of comparisons so when i heard that that was another one of the the things that kind of got me on on the path of this uh this sort of mystery um to think that it actually happened and it's not that anyone's taken you know real life events and twisted it you know it, this actually happened uh people were actually driven out of their homes and businesses were closed and you know whatever else so obviously from that i did then want to sort of dive into the more of the kind of weird and wonderful the paranormal of course and to see whether there were any those sort of links um or any of those stories now i found a few um the type of things that you would expect to find nothing overly um you know kind of compelling um you know nothing really like that um but um, generally, the opinion is, and I think this is mostly with uh, local residents, that Centralia essentially became, you know, a gateway to hell. You know, unnatural fires and heat and smoke, you know, emitting from the factory from the ground, you know, sinkholes opening up, swallowing people, buildings and, you know, the landscape. Um, you know, it's also um, disturbed graveyards um which comes up in one of the paranormal uh stories that i did find but um yeah the bodies have sort of been reclaimed as people are saying um and a lot of them have disappeared into these sort of sinkholes so they're saying that where the dead have been disturbed and you now they lay in unrest that that's kind of sparked certain sightings and and stuff which you would expect from any sort of graveyard really so i don't think that necessarily adds any weight but i thought they were interesting nonetheless um but in 1998 um on a visit to the town uh ruth edison uh, along with a friend swore that they saw two miners emerging from the smoke that was coming out of one of the large sinkholes that sat just behind the town's graveyard um now they walked uh, a short the, the two miners sorry walked a short distance um before dematerializing along with the smoke itself and that that was that was it that was kind of the extent of the encounter but you know the fact that the sinkhole had opened up behind the graveyard the fact that miners would have died in the town now they, they haven't they didn't die as a direct result of the mine fires obviously being miners you know smoke inhalation or whatever else over time that's probably what got them so the fact that they saw these apparitions of miners is, isn't particularly unsurprising uh to be honest but it is also worth noting actually that from what i could see certainly online there are no 
deaths directly attributed to the the mine fires or the fire that you know still burns within the town so there's no direct accident you know linked to that so i think that's quite you know sort of important to um you know to to note um now on the next one which is a little bit more involved um the year and date of the visit is unknown but it involves a scott sailor and and his friends um also again visiting uh centralia um they wanted to visit the town and go to sort of particular landmarks that they had been made aware of through reading articles much like what i think i did um it included route 61 which i mentioned uh something known as the burning hill and the graveyard also um now the group had been there for a while i think it was about an hour and a half in the uh, in the encounter when they caught a whiff of a strong smell of smoke um now they were in the graveyard at the time checking out sort of tombstones and you know looking at names and dates and whatever else so they then decided to follow the smell down a uh, sort of unmade gravel road um when they got to where they believed this the smoke was uh, was coming from um they saw some sort of pretty interesting fossils that caught their eye just sort of beyond some uh, some rubble along the along this path now when they walked over to investigate they all heard a disembodied voice now they didn't know at the time or couldn't figure out at the time what it had said but they all determined that it had come from below them in one of the um sinkholes or openings in you know in, in the road so they concentrated their their sort of hearing and attention to where they thought the voice had come from and the voice spoke again and they believe the voice told them to leave this place that's what it had repeated a couple of times to them um now upon hearing this they were then hit with the strong smell of sulfur which i think is quite synonymous with other um encounters um and uh i think ufos i think specifically um i don't think they knew that essentially but uh you know sort of from my sort of knowledge i believe that's the case um so the group uh decided at this point that they would basically leave and head back to their car now on their way back they had to they cut through the the graveyard again and they heard another disembodied voice um now at first again it was it was inaudible um but when they sort of were walking through concentrating their attention on the voice because again it sounded like it was coming very close from where they were standing it wasn't like over in the distance or whatever it was as though it was from someone walking with the group um and when it spoke again the voice simply said or asked why did you do that now they 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 were on their own in the town like i say it's not a tourist hot spot but obviously it doesn't stop people from going there like these urban explorers and you know probably much like myself i'd have that interest in going there just to kind of see it for myself so they, they were alone there was no other cars parked anywhere they didn't see anyone else within the town and uh and so they yeah couldn't explain it but it was freaky nonetheless and so they decided to leave which uh i think we can all agree is uh probably the fair thing to do in the uh you know in the uh in the circumstances uh but I, I probably wouldn't have stuck around after hearing two voices telling me different things especially with one of them saying leave this place obviously not the kind of, you know type of uh friendly uh welcome you would uh you know you'd want um they were probably the two most compelling that i found and you know you probably agree there's not really much to them they just sort of follow the main sort of tropes of you know ghost sightings or you know sort of interactions um another one that i didn't write down which i did read um involved a couple that again were on their own in the town uh didn't see any other cars in other people walking around but they stopped there um as they were passing through on their way to somewhere else and uh yeah they went into one of the abandoned houses um the 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 male in the in the couple um noted that on the way in he saw that a, a red number was sprayed on the front of the house and now i've seen pictures of the town around the time that most of the residents upped and left that the government had gone around 
and sprayed numbers on these homes. Now, I don't know whether it was because it was the, the number of the house um, or whether they were spray painting on the number of residents that had left at that point. I couldn't really find a reference as to what it meant, um, but he, he felt that was significant to kind of to mention. Um, but when they were exploring the second floor of the property, I think it was a three-story house, they heard footsteps coming from above them and down the staircase from the th third floor to the second floor where they were. Now, the wife walked down to the end of the hallway, stood at basically at the bottom of the stairs, expecting to, you know, kind of meet someone else that was exploring, only to not see anyone. And there was a bit of a pause in, you know, kind of the footsteps. They then heard them again, but this time they were going down from the second floor down to the first, so the flight of stairs closer to the, the husband. When he popped his head around, he noticed that there was no one there, but they could distinctly hear someone walking on wood, because you've got to think at this point there wouldn't have been any, you know, kind of carpet or, you know, anything like that. So it was walking on the floorboards, obviously not necessarily expecting it or being used to that sort of thing. And again, as what most people would do is they upped and left. They thought, sod this, and... Uh, and they left. Um, now that, like I say, they really were the only sort of real paranormal um, kind of goings on, which you, you could say would happen in any town. There wasn't anything directly linked to the, the mines, you know, kind of themselves, but you could say that they were maybe from people that worked in the mines that died and because their graves were, you know, disturbed, have they now been kind of let loose amongst the, uh, you know, the town? That's certainly what local residents believe. Um, but is that just a way of bringing people to the town and kind of putting it on the map? I don't know. They, they're not really going to get anything out of it, especially if they believe their conspiracy that, you know, all the money is, um, you know, going to the, the government. So, uh, yeah, so again, that was, um, yeah, that was really, really sort of it. Um, in terms of pulp, pop culture references, um, like I say, there was the... Uh, you know, kind of the influence on the movie Silent Hill. Um, I did watch a uh, an episode of uh, a show called The Unexplained with William Shatner, uh, which is on the, uh, the History Channel. They actually covered Centralia and uh, and kind of how it happened and, you know, the various sort of conspiracies and that kind of thing. So that was quite interesting to watch. And again, you know, I'll share the, the link, but, um, you know, obviously it gives you guys an idea on well, it gives you a perspective of, of kind of what it looks like because it's one thing, you know, hearing me talk about it and, you know, using the film as a reference, but until you actually see it, it's hard to actually believe. And, I mean, you may have even seen some of the images on social media previously because I'm sure it was an article that's been shared before. Um, and it's remarkable, you know, looking at it. You know, the road is, looks like it's just been pulled up from, you know, from the, the ground and just, you know, dropped back down again. Um, you know, it's broken and cracked and and split and yeah it just it looks mad uh you can't actually see the fire burning um certainly in any of the images that i found but you can see just like it looks like smoldering grass you know smoke coming up from just like weeds would i guess um you know and coming out of you know between cracks in the the pavement and that kind of thing but you can't actually see any kind of coals or anything burning so it must be happening at quite a depth now um so if you imagine it's been over, what, 50 years it's been burning um, quite significantly. So as it's burning and burning, it's probably burning away a lot of the coal underneath. So it's probably dropping closer to the sort of the Earth's core, which is then in turn increasing the heat, which is probably why they can't now put it out. So, yeah, as I said, whether or not they will ever be able to. It'll be an interesting one for sure to see whether they do actually end up doing anything um, or, or whether whether anything uh, is, it does actually come of it. The only other link that I found, which I know will please uh, some of our regular listeners and uh, and even Scott when he listens to this, because he hasn't he hasn't dived into this one uh, with me, sadly, because he's been too poorly, bless him. But uh, of course, with where Pennsylvania is, you know, it's one of the states that does kind of border on West Virginia. And with that, it also does make up part of the Appalachian Trail, which I know we do go over in our previous episode on, on Helia, and I think we've also mentioned it in, in, in some of the others, because in that part of the world, it is quite a prominent feature for this type of 
uh, well, not this type of phenomenon, but for, you know, for sort of cryptids and UFOs and stuff. Uh, and interestingly, the part of Pennsylvania where Centralia is, is only about 25 miles from um, the Pennsylvanian Appalachian Trail uh, section. Um, and so, you know, did the, you know, goblins and other creatures of um, of the Appalachians, did they get pushed further down the uh, the trail and through the you know the cave systems because of this burning fire um you know could it have even been a way of deterring the you know the sort of the goblins and trying to drive them into you know a particular direction of course this is all speculation and more of me just kind of having a bit of fun with it but uh i couldn't ignore the fact that it is so close to you know west virginia it's about six hours um from point pleasant west virginia to centralia which for us here in the UK is driving, you know, almost from one end of the country to the other. Um, but for the States, it's probably not that far at all, <laughs> um, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but I thought that was interesting to note again, you know, is the, a drawback to, you know, good old West Virginia. Um, there haven't been any cryptid, you know, kind of sightings or uh, any kind of UFO sightings, abductions, interactions, or anything like that so i don't think there are any you know kind of direct links but i thought with how close it is um to, to those areas and the fact that this is a, another kind of mysterious event um you know i thought it was worth uh worth noting so that brings us to the end of the mystery that is centralia pennsylvania i'm sure you'll all agree that it's certainly got some odd circumstances and even weirder that it's been left to burn for so long for seemingly no reason depending on what you choose to believe of course uh, usually at this point scott and i would now discuss our thoughts and theories and come off the fence in a little segment that we like to do at the end of every episode however with this there isn't really a need um there's no conspiracy unless you're a local resident of course and there's no cryptids or, or creatures that we know of um but i've certainly enjoyed jumping into this uh this little town and its mysterious circumstances of um, you know, what was once a, a quiet little mining town. Hopefully we will both be back and ready to jump into the intriguing goings-on within Hellier, Kentucky for our part two of the mini-series that we're doing. Um, anyway, thank you all again for the support and for, for listening. It's all much appreciated and uh, I hope you enjoyed this little one-off episode. And as always, it's uh, goodbye from me and remember... If you go down to the mine today, it's bloody hot. <laughs> Jeez, <God. laughs>